Welcome. Everything is fine. You're listening to Fork and Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week, we're looking at Season 1, Episode 11, What's My Motivation? This episode was written by Andrew Law. It's directed by Lynn Shelton, and it aired January 12th, 2017. Now, before we get into the beat-by-beat of the episode and all the little points that we want to talk about, I wanted to discuss moral motivation right at the beginning so that we can kind of keep it in mind as we're going through the episode and our listeners can keep it in mind as they're listening and thinking a little bit more critically about what's happening here. Because that is such a huge part of this episode. Yeah, exactly. It's a super big part of this episode. So as I said, we're going to focus on moral motivation. In an article titled Moral Motivation by Connie S. Riccardi, she states, In our everyday lives, we confront a host of moral issues. Once we have deliberated and formed judgment about what is right or wrong, good or bad, these judgments tend to have a marked hold on us. Although in the end, we do not always behave as we think we ought. Our moral judgments typically motivate us, at least to some degree, to act in accordance with them. So many philosophers have really tried to answer the question of what motivates us to act morally or the question of why be moral. So we'll discuss some of the theories presented by some of the philosophers we've previously mentioned. So Aristotle believed that striving for excellence, being the best person that you can be, is what motivates a person to act morally. So I read this personally as intrinsic motivation. So this motivation that comes from within, not from outside sources. Right. So it's a selfish motivation. Well, I wouldn't say selfish. It's just like some people are intrinsically motivated, right? They have goals, they have desires, and Mm -hmm. they act in a way to achieve those things. Other people are more extrinsic, extrinsically motivated um, because maybe they care about like a certain reward that they're going to get at the end. Right. Right. Immanuel Kant believed that a person has a good will when he acts out of respect for the moral law. So remember, Kant is a moral absolutist. He believes very much in black and white. He believed that the only thing that is truly good in itself is a good will. And a good will is only good when a person chooses to do something because it is their duty. Whether they like it or not. I guess so. Yeah, because it is your duty. Mm -hmm. So there is this moral law, he believes, right? And it is only good to act in accordance with that law. So to kind of summarize a little bit uh, and in a very simple way, Aristotle would believe that we are motivated by reason to be the best we can be, whereas Kant believes that we are motivated by duty. David Hume, who we mentioned back in episode four when we were discussing the philosophy of the self and we touched on his bundle theory, with the box metaphor, like how we are all of the items the in the box. combination of all of our, yeah. Mm-hmm. He has very different views than the last two. So Hume believes that morality is motivated by passion, not reason. We think something is wrong when we view an action and it gives us a negative feeling. So for example, I was just watching an episode of this TV show called The Leftovers. And in one of the episodes, a woman is beaten to death, basically. And I had a visceral reaction to that, right? I mm-hmm. was... I flinched and I cringed and I was watching it through my fingers because it felt painful to me, right? So that is my gut feeling. That is my knee-jerk reaction. So Hume would say when we have a positive or negative reaction to an act, that's the core of our moral judgment. He thought that moral beliefs essentially motivate us. To believe that doing something is wrong is to be motivated not to do that something. He acknowledges that reason is involved in any intentional act, but he insists that passion plays the role of the motivator. Hmm. So Hume believes passion motivates us to be moral. Interesting. So who do you most agree with? Uh, Remembering that Aristotle believes that reason is what motivates us, Kant believes it's duty, and Hume believes it's passion or your emotions. I think it's safe to say that I could take all three of them. Okay. Okay. As a philosopher pie. (laughs) Okay. So you get the like the three flavors all in one. Yeah. And for me personally, it's I think it's very situational depending on the circumstance. Okay. Something may motivate me a completely different way 
if I'm hungry. Okay, but think just moral um, judgment. Yeah. So not, okay, well, am I going to get a burrito or am I going to get a salad? You know, because reason might say you should get a salad, but you really want a burrito. That's not a moral judgment. Morality doesn't really come into okay, play there. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. But something like, I find this person attractive, but I'm in a relationship mm-hmm. with someone else. That's a moral judgment, right? The decision when you're, for example, you're you're, you're having a few drinks, you're at the bar, you see a, an attractive person, um, and they they wink at you or something. They're like, they're game, right? <laughs> But you're already dating somebody else. What mm-hmm. in that moment makes you, motivates you, I should say, to do the moral thing, which is either ignore the situation or say, you know, I'm already, I'm already taken, sorry, instead of cheating on your partner. What motivates you to do that? Would it be, like, if you were, imagine yourself in that situation, like, do you think it might be reason? Would it be emotion? Would it be a duty to that person? All of the above? All of the above. Okay. So you're very much like a mix of, of all the ingredients here. And a lot of times I will put myself in the person's shoes. And, oh, if I was in this situation or if I was reversed or if this situation were reversed, how would I feel? Mm-hmm. So your idea is like to treat people how you wish to be treated? I feel like personally in that moment, my decision would mainly be based on on emotion right because someone cheating on someone else when i viewed this in tv shows when i've seen it in real life happening i feel angry and upset and frustrated and all kinds of negative emotions right right if we're watching a show and this happens you get very vocal yeah you will speak out to the tv oh i definitely will because i'm angry right right? and those are negative emotions so my mind even though Uh, whatever something's going on in your relationship or something like that Mm -hmm. or you just think this person's really attractive and you figure hey what's the harm they'll never know i could never live with the emotion like the guilt that that would come come from that that right so david hume yeah i guess i would sort of side with him in that situation but there is as you said like an element of reasoning there it's Mm -hmm. like well yeah i could do this but then i might risk losing my entire relationship that I have with this other person, which is obviously more important than one night. So it's a, it's a, it is a mix of all three. I don't feel like I could agree personally with any one of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's healthy. I think it's, it's a good thing to not be solely motivated by reason. One thing that drives you. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the big issues with morality is that it's widely believed to conflict frequently and sometimes severely with what an agent most values or most prefers to do. So we don't always follow our moral beliefs. You know, I, I believe that lying is bad. You know, I don't think that it's a good thing to lie, but I do it. Mm -hmm. I do it when I feel I need to, or when I feel like it's necessary, like, a little white lie to someone or lying about something because, you know, I don't want to face the consequences of something, right? Like, I I lie. Mm -hmm. Not perfect. But if you were to ask me if I think lying is good or bad, I would say it's bad. Right. The problem with this might be because there's an opposition between self-interest and morality. If we always want to just do what's in our best interest, we're not always going to act morally, right? Mm-hmm. I want that last donut. Am I going to punch the lady in front of me in line to get that last donut? No. Seems a little aggressive. Seems a little bit excessive. Yeah, I'm not going to do that because to act in accordance with those moral beliefs, I'm not going to punch that lady. Mm-hmm. Just to go a little further on this, in contemporary moral philosophy, moral internalism is the view that moral convictions, so the feeling of moral approval or moral disapproval, like I think this is wrong or I believe this to be right, are intrinsically motivating. That is, the motivational internalist believes that there is an internal and necessary connection between one's conviction that such a thing must be done and one's motivation to do that thing. So they would believe that there is a connection between lying is bad 
and your motivation to not lie. Whereas a moral externalist would think that moral judgments about the right thing to do do not necessarily motivate you to do those things. They say that you have to have an independent desire. So if I think that helping other people is good, that does not mean that it will motivate me to help other people. I would have to have an additional desire to do that thing. Okay. Do you find that you are morally motivated like internally or externally? I think a lot of it is internal. Okay. So you you feel like your beliefs motivate you to either do or not do something. Right. Okay. You don't feel like you need a desire to I don't do or not do. I feel like I'm looking for outside elements to motivate me. Okay. So for example, um I'll give you a situation. Or I'll ask you if you share this moral belief of mine. Do you think that helping other people is good? Yes. Okay. So that is a moral belief of yours. Yeah. Now, are you motivated to help other people because you believe that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. (laughs) You're like staring at me like, good, you passed the test. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. It's just good. Okay. So you... You're, uh, you're very much. I help people because I think it's right to help people. Right. And not because. You have a desire to help people. Right. Okay. Because we could say that, for example, Jack from Lost might have a desire to help people. And that's maybe why he became a doctor. Right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of doctors, nurses, and many different professions right they'll say well i became such and such because i wanted to help people so they have this like desire to help people i think you just made people a lost watch maybe cringe a little bit (laughs) i don't think jack became a doctor because he wants to help people uh yeah i don't know (laughs) i think there's there's part of that there i think there's other motivations uh (laughs) other figures (laughs) daddy Daddy issues issues. um (laughs) But yeah, no, I think that that's just a common a common thing that you hear from doctors and nurses, especially and police. Uh, and police yeah, yeah, like I want to, I I became a police officer because I want to help people. You yeah. know, um, so they might have like this extra desire to do that thing. Yeah, I don't wake up in the morning thinking oh, I really can't wait to help people today. Yeah, like I don't I'm, either. I'm happy to help people. It's just that's not my that's not what drives me. Yeah. And it's not really what drives me either, which makes me kind of feel bad. bad. Yeah. But it's not. I have a desire to help people when I see they need help. Yeah. But that's totally different. That's not just a general urge to just be a helping Harry. Mm -hmm. I feel like being a good person. So helping when I can help and when I feel it's uh, needed and when it's appropriate. Yeah. But I don't volunteer all my time helping the needy either. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's all. That whole conversation is really just to preface what we're going to be talking about in this particular episode, which of course is... Oh, we're not done yet? Yeah. Which is, of course, what's motivating these characters? And do we think that their motivations are correct or incorrect? And it's not a subtle message throughout the episode. Like, it's... It's right on the surface. Yeah. But I feel like there are subtleties underneath it. And a little bit more that we can talk about than just the surface level. All right. Do you want to get us started with our first beat? Tahani comes up with a plan to keep Eleanor in the neighborhood. If they apply the formula to her actions in the afterlife and she can raise her point total, then they can argue she deserves to stay. Michael gives her a moral value Fitbit so she can track the points of her good deeds. So we actually get the point values displayed in this episode, and I just wanted to mention them for anyone who didn't uh, get a chance to maybe pause the screen at that moment. The real Eleanor has 2,513,654 points. Not bad. Chidi has 1,948,668 points. So he's significantly lower than the real Eleanor. Mm -hmm. But then Tahani doesn't even have a million. She has 
997,485 points. I never say large numbers out loud, so I was like, (laughs) am I saying these right? Yeah, I'm saying these right. Um, Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So yeah, how do you feel about this formula now that it's being compared to a tracker? Okay. It doesn't change how I feel about it. It makes it a bit more accessible, Mm -hmm. so everyone can see it, and the points are no longer really hidden. Mm -hmm. So he's making them public. I do recall as having a conversation, and I cannot remember which episode this was in, but where we discussed the idea of people on Earth being aware of their points. Right. So that they could judge whether their actions were moral or not. Mm-hmm. And then they would be able to tell if they were going to the good place or going to the bad place. Which right? completely defeats the purpose of the point system. Mm-hmm. And... Because then you are motivated by reward. So this actually reminds me of Black Mirror Season 3, Episode 1, called Nosedive, in which people are rated. So everybody has an app on their phone and they rate people. So people are only motivated, their actions are completely motivated by their score system. Also similar to the Community episode, Season 5, Meow Meow Beans. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. I was going to say, oh, this is Meow Meow Beans all over again. Those two episodes are very similar. Um But as soon as you show people the value of their actions, then it completely skews their actions. Right. Like it completely, it changes what people do and for what reason. Right. It changes their motivation, right? Yes, exactly. Because now they're doing it so that they can get points. Right. When Michael tells Eleanor that the average point value is 1.2 million, this task just seems completely impossible. Yeah, because she's at negative 4,000. So it's like, we know that Sean is going to arrive soon. We don't know when, Mm -hmm. but soon. There's no way. Like, what could she possibly do, right? Because the big ticket items are off the question. They're off the table. Yeah, exactly. She can't sacrifice herself. She can't save a nation. Yeah, she can't do all the big things that she might have been able to do on Earth. Yeah. And we get explicit confirmation that your intent matters in this episode. Because when Eleanor says that she'll work hard to raise her point value, but only so she can rub it in other people's faces, she loses five points. Mm -hmm. She hasn't actually acted at that point. So that tracker in that moment, like I know it's a joke, right? But it's still telling us something important about the point value system. Yeah. So it's like your thoughts and your intentions matter regardless of whether that brings you to an act or not, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. It is very interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a small point value, five points, but still, Mm. it still counts. It still counts, definitely. It's funny, especially because holding the door is three points. Yeah. And thinking about doing something for the wrong reasons is negative five. So doing something is worth less than thinking about something. Yeah. Weird. All right, so we'll move on. And we've already talked about how Eleanor begins by holding open the door to a frozen yogurt shop and greeting her neighbors, but her point value isn't changing. Chidi is surprised when real Eleanor admits her love for him. Jason wants to go public with his relationship with Janet. In a flashback, Jason plans to rob a restaurant to fund his move to Miami. I found it interesting that Tahani is just holding a point guide so that she's able to judge which accent, which actions will equal the most points. Mm-hmm. That would be a really thick book. Yeah, you would think so. Every action. Would it be listed alphabetically or a point value? But it's like, it almost feels like cheating the system then. Because then Eleanor can just figure out Oh, okay, which one, which action can I do to get me the most points? I think that's what they're doing. And Tahani settled on door holding because that's how low she, that's how little she thinks of Eleanor. Oh. What, this is all you can do to get your points holding the door. See, I don't see it that way. Okay. I don't think that Tahani feels like Eleanor can't do anything better than that. I think that she's just trying to figure out how this system works and if it's really going to improve her points. And I think she wants Eleanor to feel like a little boost. Like, hey, here's a simple task. Watch your points go up. But then when Eleanor is frustrated that her points aren't going anywhere, 
then they decide, okay, well, let's do something else. Let's do something bigger, and then maybe we'll see our points, your points, uh, rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't see it as, like, her not having faith in Eleanor. Hmm. I just, I, I see that because that's all we've been given from Tahani. Well, most of the time. She just is kind of condescending, so she doesn't think very much of people. Hmm. Okay. I guess just after last episode, watching them bond Mm -hmm. and Tahani coming up with the plan in general, I feel like her motivations for helping Eleanor are... I think they're pure. are, ...are good. I think they're good as well, but she's just so unaware of her actions and the consequences Mm. or how she treats people. She means well, but she's just a condescending person, whether she realizes it or not. Okay. We also get a hint of how Tahani died in this moment. We do. Because she said that she changed the consciousness of a nation, which did you? (laughs) Because that seems like it should be worth a lot of points. Like, That's your point total should be a lot higher than that. Definitely anyway, something Tahani would say. But then she said that she sacrificed her life to save others. Sounds like she's blowing something way out of proportion. Could be. The thing is, we don't know how we Tahani know. died. No. So, I'm open to it. And I'm going to be looking for that uh, in the coming episodes to see, okay, does she actually sacrifice herself? Or is she blowing this out of proportion? Because... I think it's important to know if she's telling the truth or if she's just telling her version of the truth. Right. If she, you're you're absolutely right. If she did move a nation or change the consciousness of a nation or sacrifice herself, her point value would be a lot higher. I think it would be. Chidi did neither of those things and and his point value is so much higher than hers, right? Right. But could that be because he was consistently like he's helping got a others more points than that. Yeah, that's a lot. Know. Yeah. <laughs> well, he certainly didn't get them for being super romantic. Nope. Because man, is he ever awkward when it comes to romance. I love this guy, but wow, saying stuff like "I love you too, egg." He just doesn't know the real <gasps> Eleanor. Oh my God, how he... dense can he be, though? Oh, he. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God. Okay, it's just such an awkward moment that I, like, cringe a little bit. I feel for real Eleanor in that moment. Her face. Mm-hmm. When she's just like, oh, no, no, honey, that was, that, that was from me, yeah. not not the egg. You weirdo. <laughs> um, do you think he doesn't, like, get romance? No, I think he doesn't love El- real Eleanor at this point. He doesn't okay. know her well enough, and... It takes time, and he's conflicted with his feelings about our Eleanor. Okay. Yeah. I agree completely. I think this is a nice extension of last week's episode when we were really focused on Chidi making a choice. And now that Chidi feels like the choice was made for him, Mm -hmm. I think he's struggling to understand how he feels about that decision. Yeah. What do you think of this particular flashback? I like these flashbacks. I think they're a lot of fun. I like seeing Jason and his, his bro. Pillboy. Pillboy. <laughs> um, they're just so alike. Yeah. They're both so dumb and so dumb. They're like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Yeah. And in Taco Bell, like, yo, I gotta go. I got diarrhea. I'll be right back. Hey, me too. I'll race you. Like, best friends. That's It's just... <laughs> It's very childish. Very childish. Yeah. Their IQ together combined is probably like 12. <laughs> I like the flashbacks. I don't think they serve the best purpose, but I still like them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just because I, I love me some Jason Mendoza. Gotcha. What about you? Well, I don't want to talk about all of the flashbacks right now, but this first one, other than surprising me, was just kind of... Not that interesting. Surprising you because they are Jason flashbacks? Yeah, it surprised me because it's a Jason flashback. But also, I just thought, oh, okay. So he's just doing bad stuff again and not really thinking about why. 
And it's just, hey, Jason's an idiot. <laughs> Jason's spontaneous. Yeah, Jason's spontaneous. He doesn't think th- things through and he's selfish and he's dumb. Like, his plan is not smart. It's not a good plan. It's not going to work. We already know that. Um, but I did like that the restaurant he plans to rob is called, and I'm going to probably not say this great, La Cantina de los Cielos, which is the Canteen of the Skies, hmm. which I thought was kind of cute because it's a little bit of a nod to the afterlife. Well, yep. it's a big nod to the afterlife. It's like the restaurant yeah. in the sky. Yeah. So, Jason, he just went to the restaurant in the sky mm-hmm. at the end of this. Because, spoiler alert, he dies at the end of this episode. Oh my god. He's yeah. dead? This is a show that I'm like kills the main characters. What? All of them. All of They're them. They're all dead? Jason, spoiler. All right, so we shall continue. Tahani mediates an open forum for the neighbors to air their grievances with Eleanor. They decide to give the neighbors a fresh start by hosting a party for them at Tahani's home. Michael is shocked to discover Janet and Jason are newlyweds. Oh, boy. Daddy's mad. Yeah. Once again, Michael's not my dad. Yep. Yep, not my dad. I'm not a girl. She continually reminds him that he's got the situation wrong. Yes. He doesn't understand the complexities. He's seeing it in very simple terms. Like, hey, there's a guy who's older than you that you used to hang around. He must be your dad. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're this thing that pops in and out of existence and can bring me anything. But sure, you're just a girl. No, it's so much more complicated than that, Jason. And finally, Jason's identity is discovered by Michael. Episode 11. Finally, right? We knew in episode, at the end of episode three. So is this how you thought it was going to go? That Michael was going to find out Jason's identity this way? No, because it's another example of Jason being dumb. Yeah, their wedding rings are massive, the both of them, especially his. And they're out in public and... I mean, Jason kind of wants to tell the world. Yeah. Despite Janet saying no. It's like he just doesn't understand consequences. Right. We've talked about how impulsive he is and spontaneous he is. Yeah. But he's thought about this, right? He tells Janet, I want to be open with our relationship. And then she says, well, you can't. And here are the many reasons why. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, but I don't want to hide. You're like, well, what's more important? You have to weigh these things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. We've got two people that don't belong. Eleanor, who confesses, and Jason, who is discovered, right? Mm -hmm. The two sides of it. As much as my feelings for Janet and Jason's relationship have kind of dimmed now that we've had so many discussions about her personhood, I still really like the line, she makes the bass drop in my heart. It's so, so silly, but it's really sweet. So sincere. That's it. It's just, as stupid as he can be, he's so sincere. He's like, I don't know, like a a puppy, like a little child. Everything that he says, you know he means it because he's not the type of person to lie to you, really. Yeah, I don't even know if he's capable of it. (laughs) He wouldn't be good at it. No, he wouldn't. The only reason he was able to keep his identity secret is because he just didn't say anything that's right. not lying that's just lying by omission i guess it's yeah. just not talking um and janet's response is pretty great jason is a person who is near me and then he asked me to marry him and there is nothing in my protocol that specifically barred that from happening so i agreed <laughs> and him love you too babe <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness yeah but we're getting the idea here that It wasn't really something that she wanted. It was, like we said last episode, her fulfilling her protocol of making the residents happy. There's no reason for her to say no. So she she requested something from her. She was able to give it to him. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. That's her protocol. She filled a request by doing this. Then she confuses me in this moment because she says that she suspects that she bonded with Jason after she rebooted and gained a new understanding of love. And then she tells Jason, I love you, first. She doesn't say it in response. Yeah. That's just something I want us to 
keep in mind because we're going to have a it. whole discussion about her later in uh, in this episode. But yeah, that's that's an interesting point. So we do know that she's not fulfilling some of her duties mm-hmm. by some people have been asking for her and she hasn't been showing up. Yes. So she can break protocol. Hmm. Which is an interesting thought. Yeah. It's just something to consider later on. But if she's programmed to respond to people who ask her questions or need her help. And she isn't. And she isn't. Yeah. Because she's distracted with Jason. So I thought it'd be interesting to just consider that later on. Yes, definitely. We will keep that in mind. All right. So we'll push forward. Chidi asks fake Eleanor advice regarding his love life while he helps her prep for the party. Michael explains the real Jianyu, a young Taiwanese monk, went into such a deep meditative state that he registered as dead, and the system likely mistook Jason for him because they share the same IQ. In a flashback, Jason and Pillboy attempt to rob a restaurant by installing a safe in the office. I think they did a really good job with the details at the party, because Tahani and Eleanor are wearing the same dresses that they were wearing in the first episode, and there's this abundance of shrimp, right? Because... Eleanor was the one who ate pretty much all the shrimp at the first party. She was hoarding it. Yeah, she really was. Because she was like, well, it's the, you know, this is basically heaven. I'm sure there's plenty of shellfish here, right? Which is true. But Michael had that moment where he was like, oh, I completely underestimated how much shrimp we would need for the party. Mm -hmm. And so in this moment, I love that Eleanor thought to herself, oh, we need to have lots of shrimp. Like lots, (laughs) like way more than necessary. She's got, like, this huge bowl of shrimp. Anyway, I just thought it was funny. You no, know? it's just details that if you're looking for it, you'll see it. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about Chidi and his reluctance to say I love you to the real Eleanor. This is a running bit in, like, movies, TV shows all the time. Someone says I love you and the other person says, oh, thanks. Or how about that? Or, I love Spending time with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, avoiding saying those dreaded three words. Mm-hmm. It makes sense to me. Like, I totally get Chidi not wanting to say it because he doesn't want to say it if he doesn't mean it. Because his moral code mm-hmm. says that's wrong. Exactly. Like, and I don't think he knows her well enough to know if he can love her for her and not just, hey, as my soulmate. Right. He needs yeah. to spend more time so he can know for sure why he loves her. Mm -hmm. So contrary to Chidi from the past episodes where he has trouble making any decision, and this is a good hesitation on his part. Yeah. He is within his all his rights to not decide whether he loves her or not. Mm -hmm. Like, he should take all the time he needs. I agree. So it's nice to see when it matters, he can't make a decision. And then when it doesn't matter, he still can't make a decision. (laughs) (laughs) So he's consistent. He's very consistent. Okay. Because there's so much pressure to love her, too. Everyone expects him to. Because she suddenly appears and she's his soulmate. So I have to love her because that's what I'm supposed to do here in the good place. Yeah, and real Eleanor is not letting it go. Like, she says, oh, you know, take your time, you don't have to say it. But then at the party, when she approaches him, she's like, hey, have you made a decision yet? It's like, um, if you could lay off, maybe I could, but you're pressuring me and this is making things worse. Maybe she's just anxious to get an answer because she's been tortured for a while, so she's hoping to feel some happiness. Well, go take a dang bubble bath or something, lady, because... <laughs> Spend some time in your clown corner. Yeah, exactly. If you could just not pressure him, that would be real, real swell of you. Um, She's pressuring him, but not. I mean, take your time. But if you could Like, tell answer me, me in the next, like, hour. Like, I'm going to keep reminding you, but no, take your time. Yeah. It's good. But, like, do you have an answer? But take your time. <laughs> but then fake Eleanor... Puts Chidi's mind at ease with her faith in the soulmate system. She says, you know, she's universe approved. Just tell her you love her. Don't overthink it. And she earns 20 points. 
Does that seem high, low, average? How do you interpret that? It seems kind of low to me. Okay. Telling somebody, basically setting them up with their soulmate, seems like it should be worth a little bit more. Okay. And that's really good advice. Now, my question is, do you think she earned those points because she listened and she gave him good advice or because she sacrificed her feelings to make Chidi happy? I think she would have got even more points if she had done that. I don't see it like that at all. No? Okay. Because I see her as admitting that in the past last episode, Chidi's choice, that her feelings towards him were not romantic. So she's given up that. She's not holding a torch for him anymore. Oh. So her telling Chidi to just go for it and stop beating around the bush is not her sacrificing her own feelings. Okay. Because she has convinced herself, maybe I think she's convinced herself that her feelings are just friendly. Mm-hmm. So her telling him to go for fake Eleanor is just her giving advice. Just like, this I is what you need to do. To my You're my friend. I want you to feel good. So I want you to be happy. So go do this because this is what's right. It's not like go to fake Eleanor because we're never going to be and she's your real soulmate and we're never going to have the same connection that you two are. So I'm going to take one for the team and you just go do your thing. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I see that. I think when you added um, the point that Eleanor has convinced herself that her feelings aren't romantic, Mm -hmm. that's when I was like, okay, yeah, I can be on board with this opinion. Like... Yeah, I still think she has sure. romantic feelings for him, but she's convinced herself otherwise. Right, right. Yeah, that's how I feel too. And just as a little side note, I will never understand Eleanor's dislike of glasses because I think glasses are sexy. <laughs> and I like them on men and I like them on women. Uh, I like them whoever. on rocks. I like them on cats and dogs. I like glasses on everything. Right. I think that she thinks he would be more attractive without glasses. I think she just looks at them and she's like, "Ugh, you're such a nerd. Take those off. (laughs) (laughs) Which, ain't nothing wrong about being a nerd. So. I do like that we see that Michael's using the same litmus test for Jason. And then, of course, that he answers yes to everything. Yeah, Eleanor (laughs) Eleanor is appalled by all these questions. And Jason's, like, excited and happy about answering all of them wrong. Oh, God. Although, I don't quite understand the negative Red Hot Chili Peppers references. Maybe it's just like an inside joke. Oh, I I think it's just that the Red Hot Chili Peppers have been criticized and the writers probably don't like them that much. That's possible. Yeah. They're no... They're definitely no bare naked ladies. They don't have... What, they're not triple platinum? (laughs) (laughs) Um, actually, I have no idea about the success of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but, uh, the chilies, Mm -hmm. as Jason likes to call them, they're not exactly known for their range or their depth. Um, so I think, yeah, it's probably that, probably that they tend to talk about Southern California and also drugs in Southern California. And they played a show... At least one show naked wearing socks on their wieners. Ew. <laughs> I do not want to see that. No. Mm-mm. Okay. Guys, she's Googling it right now. No, I am not. Tap, tap, tap. <laughs> <laughs> the flashback with Jason and Pillboy again solidifies just how dumb they are. Mm-hmm. And their plan completely and utterly failing. Because it's literally the worst plan ever. And it's kind of depressing once you get to the final flashback to think that Jason is probably already dead in that moment. Yeah. When Pillboy is whispering to him, like, You gotta wear I do, I do. And he's probably dead in there. That's really morbid. Kind of messed up. Yeah, but it's kind of funny thinking of him curled up in there with a snorkel in his mouth. Okay, but also. Still dead. Still dead. It's still his best friend just died and he's not even aware. Yeah. I do like how the cashier, she's just staring at him like, are you serious? Like, this isn't really happening. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) 
I love how he doesn't take the opportunity to run either. Yeah, he just says, we gotta get married now. We gotta get married now. Like, no, you could roll the safe out of the store and go. Yeah. But I guess that shows a little bit of loyalty because he doesn't immediately bolt. He could leave the safe there. Yeah, he sticks with his friend. Yeah. So, respect He sticks to the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Even though the plan is awful. Yeah. Clearly, they're not very good at improvising. (laughs) All right, moving on. Chidi struggles to declare his love. Meanwhile, Michael locks Jason in his office before going to Eleanor's party. Eleanor is discouraged that her point value hasn't increased. She apologizes to everyone, saying, Pobody's nerfect. So the extended episode includes a couple scenes that are not at all in the uh, regular aired episode. Really? Yes. We have a scene at the party where Chidi feels pressured by both fake Eleanor and real Eleanor to declare his love for his soulmate. And then we have another scene where Michael locks Jason in his office. So those that are... wasn't in the aired. No, neither of those scenes were in the aired version. Okay. So just a reminder to those people listening, you should really be watching the extended episodes. Those are the ones that we are reviewing. And there are sometimes entire scenes or really important lines that we're discussing that you might be missing out on if you don't watch those ones. Again, they're available on the NBC website and I believe on Hulu as well. So yeah, definitely worth watching them. So the scene where Michael locks Jason in his office, Jason asks him, or are you putting me in jail? And Michael says, no, 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 no. We don't, you know, put people in jail in the good place. It's just that I'm going to keep you in this room as a form of public safety and punishment, and you will not be able to exit this room. Right. Okay, bye! So he describes jail after mm-hmm. saying it's not jail. Um, And I think part of it is just him not knowing what to do in this moment. Like, he's just completely caught off guard, and he's like, um, I don't know, but I know he's made... He's done some serious crimes, so I guess I should just keep him away from everybody. And he wants to keep Jason away from Janet. Yes, very true. So, although Jason can call Janet at any time. Yeah, he could just call her out. So, maybe Janet was just with Jason all night. We don't know. And they were smooching and trying out the number of, the optimum number of tongues. Oh, I like to think they were bumping and grinding. Nope. 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 They were listing off all the flavors of Doritos? Okay. So, when Eleanor realizes that she's not getting any more points from this. She's feeling frustrated. And I remember when I first watched the episode, I thought, well, how come she's not getting any points? Like, she got points when she was helping Chidi. And she lost points when she was talking about um, rubbing it in everyone's faces. But now that she's actually doing something nice, how come she's not getting any? And when she says to everyone that she never meant to hurt them, It was interesting because everyone's judging Eleanor based on her actions, right? But then she's judging herself later and realizing why she's not getting any points based on her motivation. She's not looking at her actions. Because if you're just looking at her actions in this episode, she's doing good things. Right. Right? So. But the good place looks deeper. Yes. The good place looks deeper. They see. They can... It's like they just know your motivation. You don't have to do anything. They just know. Yeah. What did you think about Eleanor's little joke? Poetry's nerfect. Oh, I think it's so dumb. (laughs) I hate the reaction that everybody has. And I know you're supposed to. You're supposed to think that... How are all these people finding this funny? Oh, yeah. It's not really that funny. No, it's not. It's pretty dumb, but... Yeah. I actually think the reaction is kind of adorable because everyone here is so square that they think that that's funny. I know. (laughs) And it takes them a moment like, what did she just say? Oh my goodness. I have to analyze this. Wait, hold on a second. Oh, but it's funny because... And then you got the guy who's explaining explaining the joke. Yeah. And you have uh, the lady later who just keeps repeating the joke It just reminds me of, like, moms trying to be super hip. Yeah, exactly. By, like, saying, 
hey, son, you left your swagger in here, but not realizing <laughs> what that means or anything. And then suddenly her son starts laughing because, oh, that's so funny. And no. No. But it's just, no, no, no. It, like, that's not Eleanor. I'm thinking, like, all of the people in The Good Place are, like, the mom who yeah. doesn't get the joke. Right. Or gets it, but has to over-explain it and then tries to use it so frequently, but not properly. And then misuse properly. it. And, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of more like, oh, you guys. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, honey. Oh, honey. Uh. <laughs> I wonder when the Pobody's Nerfix shirts are going to come out. Yeah. Yeah. They should make those. Actually, little Pobody's Nerfix pins might be good. Yeah. I think those would be cuter. I don't really think I want a whole shirt. Especially if they're not... Especially if they're going to be, like, a bright yellow shirt. No, thank you. It's a lot better than... It's a lot better than her previous shirt, the dress bitch shirt. Yeah, yeah. It. Oh, that's true. I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. Huh. It's almost like, yeah, she's using these shirts to make up for the other ones. Huh. Wow. Eleanor's just going to be like the t-shirt person. She's got people in the bad place wearing her dress bitch shirt. And then she'll have people in the good place wearing her Pobody's Nerfix shirt. She's a fashion queen. She of is. Good place. What an icon. <laughs> Tahani's jealous. Yeah, totally. All right, let's get to our last bit because we've got quite a bit to talk about. Eleanor realizes that her actions had no moral value because her motivations were corrupt. Michael reveals the cause of Jason's death, suffocating inside a safe during his robbery attempt. Michael goes to reboot Janet in an attempt to fix the glitch that is her relationship with Jason, but Janet chooses to leave before that happens. The judge, Sean, arrives. Janet, Jason, and Eleanor steal his train to go to a neutral zone. Everything's just... The climax of this episode is... happens pretty quickly. It does happen pretty quickly. It kind of turns into an exciting last couple of minutes. Mm Mm-hmm. It does. oh, oh, what's going on? Oh, people are leaving? Yeah. This is interesting. Because we've been told this entire time there's only a good place and a bad place. There's nothing in between. Eleanor's been asking for a medium place this whole time. Mm -hmm. And then we finally get this information in the last minute, two minutes of the episode. Yeah. Where it's like, there is a neutral zone. She doesn't call it the medium place. It's not like a bunch of people live there. She says it's one woman, but That's Eleanor's. She coins the term. Yeah. Yeah. So we discussed earlier um, motivations, right? And what motivates people to act morally and whether or not motivations really matter. So I just want to say here that we might be concerned that holding the wrong motivations, even if one makes an acceptable choice now, might lead them to acting unacceptably in the future when being guided by the same motivations. So if you're doing a good thing, but with the wrong intent, then we might be concerned that you will continue to use that intent and therefore stop doing good actions, right? So if Eleanor is doing all of these good things just so she can stay in the back or so if Eleanor is doing all of these good things just so she can stay in the good place once she realizes her motivation is corrupt then maybe she'll stop doing good things no I was thinking more along the lines of Eleanor might stop necessarily doing good things she might just her motivations might lead her to act more selfishly because that was her motivation when we started this this show, right? She wanted to stay in the good place. So she was hiding. She was lying to people. She was doing these things that were bad, right? right? And that's the same motivation. Her motivation hasn't changed. Right. Right? It's only when her motivation has been correct, we could say, that her actions have really meant more. Right. And we've only seen a couple situations where that happened. Exactly. Yeah, when she sacrificed herself so that Chidi wouldn't be racked with guilt. Um, when she gave him advice in this episode. When she gave Tahani advice. Yeah. In episode three or four. And even when she was talking to Michael and Trevor. 
and saying that the reason she wanted to stay in the good place is because she wants to be like Chidi and the real Eleanor. She wants to be a better person. Right. Right. It's like she stopped wanting that as soon as it became about the numbers. Then it became, okay, well, this is my goal. All right. Get that number and then I'm good. I don't have to think about anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And on the topic of Sean, now that he's here, we've seen him and we will talk to him again in the future. The judge. Mm-hmm. Our judge. This reminded me of um, Hume's response to some criticism that he received. So one of the criticisms of Hume's view is that it appears highly subjective. So if lying is wrong means I don't like lying, it makes me feel bad, then our moral views are subjective. Hume secures a sort of objectivity for moral judgments by requiring that before an expression of approval or disapproval can be deemed moral, it must be made by a certain type of person. So basically, you have to meet a certain criteria for your moral views to be ex- deemed moral. To be validated. Yeah, to be valid, right? Uh, so it can't just be anybody. He said that the only person whose approval or disapproval is properly moral is a true judge, a person who has adopted a stable and general perspective on this issue. A person who has adopted a stable and general perspective on the issue. So basically an unbiased perspective. Third party. Yeah. So this true judge could be Sean, could right? Could be a literal judge. Yeah. Yeah. So this could be applied to Sean and also to the creator or the creators of the point value system. Right. Which I think is interesting. So were you surprised by this twist when Eleanor decides that she's going to leave? No. No? No, I was surprised at Janet and Jason leaving. Oh, okay. I totally expected Eleanor to leave if she were given the opportunity. If something presented itself, like a medium place, I would totally expect her to go. But were you surprised that she was going to sacrifice herself and go to the bad place? Because that's that's her original plan, right? She only changes her mind once she learns about the neutral zone. But originally, she intends to just go to the bad place. She seems to think that if she goes there and maybe spends some time there and becomes a better person in the bad place, that she'll somehow earn a spot in the good place. At least that's how I was reading it. I wasn't surprised so much that she would sacrifice herself, but only because I didn't believe the show would actually send her there. Okay. So I was expecting something else to happen to postpone her journey, and it did happen. Janet and Jason showed up. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was the twist that I was surprised about. Janet leaving with Jason, saying, we have to go. So as soon as she tells Eleanor about the medium place or the neutral zone, that's where things got interesting for me. Okay. Because that, I wasn't expecting any of that. Mm -hmm. But Eleanor sacrificing herself doesn't surprise me. She's done it before, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. She is learning a lot. That's a huge, that's a lot of growth for Eleanor. And we've seen it over the past few episodes. So that doesn't surprise me. It's believable. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I'm wondering about her plan. It seems, like I said earlier, that she's planning on eventually coming back here. Why or earning that? her place here. Because I don't think she was, she's like, I can't be a better person while I'm, like, I can't become a better person here. Because I'm only ever just going to want to be here. But the thing is, if she goes to the bad place, sacrificing herself, but with the intention of returning to the good yeah, place, that... then it seems like her motivation is still the same. Exactly. So it's a little bit confusing. I guess I just don't feel like she's actually sacrificing herself for real. Like maybe it's one of those, oh, well, I will go and I will suffer my fate and maybe someday. So it's not like her main motivation, but I can't really buy into the fact that it's not at all there. Mm -hmm. 
you know? Yeah. I think maybe part of her was hoping something would happen Mm -hmm. to stop her. Yeah. So I did notice that Eleanor was reading a book. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. When she's uh when she's waiting for Janet. She's reading a novel called Natural Goodness by Philippa Foote. Not a great last name. <laughs> Philippa Foote. Philippa Foote. She's a contemporary British philosopher. And fun fact, she actually came up with the famous thought experiment of the trolley problem. Oh, okay. Mhm. In this book, she outlines her theory, which she calls natural normativity. This is a form of realism that believes that ethical judgments are true because they are grounded in natural facts about life. So she argues for the claim that ethical behavior is rational. And this is the basis of her naturalism. She believes that no one could possibly have a reason to act in a way that is contrary to the nature of their species. So she uses examples of animals. For example, bees are social creatures. So if bees don't interact with other bees so that they can do bee things. do their bee things, make their honey, whatever, then they are acting contrary to their nature. Right, because right? they would die. Yeah. So in her mind, it's like morality is just a part of nature. You know, you are just moral. Like, it's almost like your default moral, right? Sure. And then if you do not act morally, then you are just acting contrary to your nature. Or if you have a a malfunction in your brain or an issue there, then it switches off your, you know, your ethical buttons. Yeah. She actually says that people that act contrary are somehow defective. Right. Right? Um, Which is actually scientifically proven in a lot of cases with some serial killers yes yes people who lacked uh lack empathy um and have like violent tendencies for sure yeah it's interesting um i'm not really too sure why they picked such a what seems a little bit random to me um but it's interesting it's like eleanor in this moment is acting contrary to who she used to be so contrary to her nature um and in this moment, she's actually kind of proving Philippa Foot wrong, maybe? Because contrary to her nature is acting morally. Or you could say that Eleanor is finally acting morally because she's doing what she should be doing as, as a, um, a part of the human race. From what I understand about Philippa Foot's theories is that If we went against our human nature. Mm -hmm. Which is to be moral. Yeah. Yeah. Doing something that is immoral that it almost pushes us away from humans as a social species or Mm -hmm. it makes us an outcast. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm thinking about Eleanor pre afterlife, like Eleanor on Earth, Mm -hmm. she was always acting contrary to her or to human nature as we often think of it, right? Like she lied to people all the time she cheated she she pushed did all friends. kinds of yeah she did all kinds of things and like you just said she pushed away friends she pushed away family like she isolated herself so she was constantly acting contrary to what philippa foot would say is her human nature right and so she was acting immorally and now in this moment when she has community and she's sacrificing herself um to be a better person and to strive for for goodness and she feels love now and um like she's just acting morally yeah. right so now finally she's getting it yeah and also she's reading a philosophy book she is she doesn't by even herself. have to i'm assuming it's something that chidi pointed her to but like She's still reading it? She's going to take that to the bad place? What if her bag is literally just full of textbooks? On philosophy. Or like philosophy books, yeah. I like to think that's very true. And each one has a little bookmark in it because she's already made her way th- through all of them. Like, she's dived into all of them, like, a little bit. Oh, She's doing that's her... That's nice. 
but of her that, own accord. that reinforces my point that she's planning on coming back or that she wants to still be better regardless. She hasn't given up. Or she thinks there's going to be like a little nook in the bad place where she can have free time to read a book. You know, you're getting pulled apart, reading a book. You can do these things all at the same time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not really a party if you can read. Hmm. I guess not. Just before we get to the topic of Janet, I do want to point out that there is a sign that says Celestial Perk, which is a really cute little subtle friends reference because in Central Perk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they also have a sign for a store called Jetpacks and such. Yeah, I like that. Which I thought was cute. Why and then, do people need jetpacks if they can fly? Uh, because he's banned flying exactly. for a thousand years. So do you not jet remember? Jetpacks and such popped up. Yeah, exactly. I like that. It filled a gap in what people needed. Exactly. And filling a gap is what it's all about. That sounded dirty. Okay. So let's get to Janet. <laughs> so this last moment is really when things started to get murky for me. Mm -hmm. When Janet says, Jason, you are all that I care about. Possibly because I did not have the capacity to care about anything before you. I love you. And then she makes the choice to leave before Michael can reboot her. And she decides that she no longer belongs now that she can think and feel. Mm -hmm. Whoa. To me, she's way closer to personhood now. Yeah. I'm like honestly wondering if she just is a person yeah. at this point. Because changed. she's experiencing feelings. Like love and happiness, but also frustration and anger and fear. She acts out with Michael. She yeah. even like gets an attitude with him. Mm -hmm. We've never seen that. No. And she's like shut down immediately. Like he shuts her up really quickly by just saying, "Yeah, because you she's shouldn't act still, this way." As a core, she's still a program, mm -hmm. and she still has the capacity to. She still has her protocols in place, right? But she's added on these extra feelings. It's like she opened up a new program that was called feelings.exe. <laughs> or like, here, now I can think for myself. Yeah. But not only that, but she's just, she's making decisions. Like, yeah, for she, herself. She has her own interests in she mind. She decided to leave with Jason. Yeah, she says to him, like, I don't want him to reboot me. I'm afraid that we're going to fall out of love, so we should go. Mm -hmm. Like... That's huge. That is a big moment for her. Yeah. Because that shows that she has something that's important to her that she's not willing to lose. Yep. Which is a very human thing. So if we compare this reaction to the one she had when she was rebooted the first time, when she was just happily showing them her big murder button as she was calling it basically and yeah like tell him how it works you guys can reboot me right just press that button no big deal and now it's like oh my god i don't want to be rebooted we got to get out of here because i have something i could lose right now yeah now i have something i care about so if we look back to our criteria of personhood mm -hmm. from episode seven um we said that there were five five uh criteria so the first one was consciousness um, of objects and events external or internal to the being, and in particular, the capacity to feel pain. Do you think that has changed? We said that she doesn't feel pain and that she assures them that her death will not bring her any pain, which was true. Yep. She won't feel any physical pain. I right. don't think that that has changed. Correct. But I think she would feel loss and she feels fear. Yeah. And that is a kind of pain. Sure. So I think she's not fully, like, she can't completely tick that box, but uh, you could maybe fill it in a little bit. Our second was reasoning, which we just said that Janet can do this. She can solve problems. Um, no big deal. Third was self-motivated activity, which was when we said, no, she doesn't really have that. Because Janet's activity was motivated primarily by the desires of others, right? She was just fulfilling her protocol. Yeah. But now, as you stated earlier, she's not. Like, she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. She's spending her time with Jason. Yeah. Um, And now she's got her own motivations, right? She wants to stay here 
and be happy and be with Jason and experience new feelings. Like, she feels such joy at the idea that she can now hate things, right? Like, she's ecstatic that she's learning and growing. And she still talks robotically sometimes. Mm -hmm. But she also has the ability to hate things and feel and think for herself. Yeah. She makes decisions now. So that third box definitely checked. Okay, so now we're checking that box. Didn't used to be checked. No. Um, Fourth is the capacity to communicate by whatever means, blah, blah, blah. Janet can do this. She can communicate. Yep. Never, never an issue. And the last one is the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness, either individual or racial or both. Mm-hmm. And we said that she was aware of herself, but she didn't think of herself as a person. Right. Do you think this has changed? Now, I feel like this is an important point because whether or not you view yourself as a person should matter. Right. In your personhood, I think. So. Especially when it comes to, like, robots. She even says this episode, I'm not a girl. Yeah. Michael's not my father. I'm not a girl. Um, I don't think she sees herself as a person yet. But that's only because I don't think she understands that all these feelings that she's feeling pretty much define a person. Mm -hmm. So if she were to evaluate rationally or go through maybe a list like this or like Mm -hmm. something like that, then she might actually come to the conclusion that she is a person. Yeah. So she may not be a biological girl or female, but she may not consider personhood to be different at this point. Mm -hmm. So if she were to do that, then I think she would check that box. Okay. So has your opinion of Janet's personhood changed now? Do you think that she is a person? I'm holding off on giving a a solid answer. Okay. Because the show is trying to change how we view her. Mm -hmm. They're making Janet... they're, They're... They're evolving Janet, Mm -hmm. which is great, but she's still a device. She's still a robot. She's still programmed to serve people and can be rebooted. Yeah. Um, And Michael does it with absolutely no hesitation. Right. Right. Because it's a tool that he has that's malfunctioning. Yeah. So he's got to fix it. And she's considered a property of the good place, right? So, although in her mind, maybe her purpose has changed a little now that she is in a relationship, now that she's married, um, but to Michael, her purpose has not changed. She's still Janet. She should still be helping the residents. And everything that she does that is counter to that is just a malfunction. Right. Is a glitch, right? So, in your opinion. Like, what do I think? Um, I, yeah, I'm going to stay with you. Yeah. Um, I think she's real close. I yeah. think she's getting very close. I'm going to keep tracking it. I'm honestly surprised that she got this close because obviously when we were talking about this in episode seven, I knew mm-hmm. what was going to happen. Of course. I just forgot, I guess, little moments here and there and little things that she had said that really impact how I feel about her. She slapped Jason's butt. Yeah. Do you think that's because he told her to or just because she wanted to? I like to think it's because she wanted to. <laughs> or she had seen it in movies. Yeah. In her extensive research. Yeah. Maybe it's something that she had picked up on or maybe it's something that he did to her. Oh, yeah. Okay. That she figured I should reciprocate. Uh, we don't really get the idea that she has like a sexual desire. Right. Um, because when... When they're kissing. When they're kissing, she's got her eyes open. She looks like... A robot kissing somebody, right? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was kind of a weird little moment. It was cute, though, in a way that, like, children kind of imitate adults. And how we, in life, imitate people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think that she's a person yet. And I know that some of our listeners are going to hear that and be like, Vivian... Oh my goodness, what will it take? Do they for need you to, to spell it out for you? Like, when will you finally admit that she's a person? You're so robophobic. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Robophobia is a real thing. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, that's our episode title. Um, <laughs> robophobia. Um, there must actually be like a phobia. Anyway, I'm not looking it up because I, I like know. ours better. But yes, my views haven't changed completely. I haven't done a 180. I still don't think that she's a person, but she's dang close. Okay? Yep. So, you never know. We've got two episodes left. Maybe by the end of this season, I'll be saying, spoiler alert, guys, Janet's a person. I don't know. So. I honestly don't. <laughs> we do discuss each episode as if we haven't seen the rest of the series. Yes, of course. Because that's why we have the spoilers on at the end. Mm-hmm. So, in our discussion of personhood and Janet in episode five or six or seven episode seven in episode seven we were viewing it as if we were watching it for the first time yes so just keep that in mind for all you haters out there like shaking your fists like oh you're turning around and changing your views and no yeah we're using the information that we have at that point in the series right so I know that there were a few people who were saying, well, no, Janet's a person because she gets married to Jason or she decides to go to the neutral zone. Like, that hadn't happened yet. I couldn't use that as any information. I was just pretending I didn't even know about that. Yeah. So. Spoiler alert, guys. We totally knew. Like, of course. (laughs) Um... Is there anything else you want to discuss before we get to our spoiler zone? It feels like a three-part finale or even a four-part finale. Okay. Like this all these last four episodes could be put together as one movie, like okay. an hour and a half long finale. Mhm. And it's very Unlike sitcoms that are on TV right now. And I think it's great. I agree. If you came into this show and just watched an episode, it's not like Friends. You can't just jump in and watch an episode and jump into another season and watch another episode. They're very serialized. Yes, they really are. It's surprisingly serialized. And they started that pretty much from the second episode. Yeah. You really had to know what was going on right from the beginning. And for a half hour or like a 20 minute show, it's rare Mm -hmm. to have a serialized show. Yeah, it is rare. You're right. There's a funny moment that I didn't mention in, uh, there's a funny moment that I didn't mention earlier, but the look that Michael gives Jason when Jason realizes why the snorkel inside the safe didn't work is gold it's so funny oh. he just looks so like how how can what? anybody be this dumb how <laughs> it's just perfect he looks so appalled and kind of disgusted a little bit it's just ted danson does a great job in that moment of just being baffled yes. in every way um what did you think of jason saying that Janet should leave him. Did you think that that was like... That was really big of him. Yeah. That was that was almost like Eleanor level of growth. Really? Like, okay. He realizes that maybe they're not... Maybe he can't look after her. But mm-hmm. at the same time, this is the good place. And also she doesn't need to and be looked all, after. Exactly. So She's literally way more powerful than you are. Yeah. So... It's kind of sweet. At the same time, it's still him being pretty dumb. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't see it as very much growth. I thought it was kind of sweet that he was just like, well, I'm an idiot and you're so smart. You shouldn't be with someone who's so dumb. But. He wasn't thinking about himself. Yeah. Like he was, he's so self-centered in everything. Well, not self-centered, but he's so spontaneous and doesn't think about consequences and doesn't think past his own goals that seeing this, seeing him, like, evaluate something and stop and pause and think for a moment is very different. We don't really see that from Jason. It's kind of neat to to watch him just be like, oh, yeah, maybe you're not the best for me because 
I'm dumb and you're super smart. And like, yeah. I don't deserve you. Yeah. 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 Because as far as we've seen, Jason has been very selfishly motivated throughout this whole show and pretty much throughout all of his life. Yep. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't say it's like Eleanor level growth. Okay, that's fair. But... It's a little bit of a stretch. It is some growth. It is nice to see that he took a moment to think about this and consider someone else's feelings, right? Yeah. And act selflessly. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. If you have thoughts you'd like to share, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio or use the hashtag FBullshirt. Or you can find us at Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. You can also visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. See you next week for a review of episode 12, Mindy St. Clair. We only have two episodes left, guys. This is a short season with only 13 episodes. So you should start sending us your theories for season two and any questions or thoughts you have remaining for season one so that we can get to all of it. Um, I'm so excited. And stay tuned for, you know, maybe a a guest, a special guest for episode 13. We have a special guest? Episode 13? We might. We might. You never know. Oh my goodness. What will I wear? You were just like, what? (laughs) Since our finale episode is coming up soon, we will be taking a break from The Good Place because there won't be any new episodes to review. But if you have any suggestions for things that uh, we could do in the meantime. Maybe a short show or if... Or a movie. A couple movies or something. Yeah. Let us know if there's anything interesting for you guys out there you want us to pick apart. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, bye. Spoiler zone, spoiler zone, spoiling everything, spoiling movies, spoiling food. It's just Norman and drag. Woo! <laughs> oh man, that's an old one. If you don't know that spoiler. Old spoiler. Movies from 1998. Vince Vaughn, Norman Bates. Nope. No? Mm-mm, there was mm-mm. another one? There was. Oh gosh. Oh goodness. Who was in that one? Who made that one? I don't know. Alfonso Hitchcoser. <laughs> Hitchcoser? Okay. Uh, All right. So, I don't have a heck of a lot to say. I can say heck. Heck is a fine word. All right. So, I don't have a heck of a lot to say in this spoiler zone because we are getting to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So... Do you think that the moral Fitbit is a real tool or is it just something that Michael created to torture Eleanor or like corrupt her motivations, right? Because as soon as numbers become part of the uh, experience, it seems like Mm -hmm. things just change a little bit. It's like your attitude towards them. I like that idea that he just made it to mess with her despite he actually he made it functional. Hmm. But he still provided it. Yeah. So this is Michael's last... It feels like he's on the edge of not knowing what to do. Like he's just grasping at straws at this point. He'll do anything to try and reel in this whole experiment. Mm -hmm. And it almost worked, I think. Yeah, I think it almost worked because... Technically, she was going to get sent away, but the thing is, she can't be sent away, so Mm. it almost, it could have continued to work if Sean didn't show up for a while. She would have continued to use it, and I think he was probably counting on her not figuring out that it was her motivation that was keeping from the points from going up. Right. Again, underestimating people. Yeah. Um, I think that having Sean come and do his judgment and everything still 
if all the plan went through, Michael would have had Eleanor stay Mm -hmm. with some sort of, have Eleanor stay with some sort of requirement like you need to keep doing certain things or you need to keep learning or you need to keep doing good things. Right. Or give her some difficult tasks that she needs to continue to do that would conflict with everybody else to right. cause more headbutts. Okay. So I think he would have convinced Sean to get her to stay if she hadn't have screwed everything up again. And done something that he did not expect. Mm-hmm. She's unpredictable, that Eleanor. She is. So I noticed that when Michael has Eleanor check the moral Fitbit and then he leaves, he says the nightmare continues twice. And the second time, he doesn't seem unhappy. He's kind of got a little bit of a smirk on his face. Because he's walking away and Tahani and Eleanor can't see him mm-hmm. anymore. So it's like he's letting his mask slip a little bit, which a I liked. Bit. I liked. I thought so, that was a good uh, good little tiny, tiny hint when you're watching it again. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, do you think people, do you think there are many people that figured it out? No. I don't. Uh, the general reaction from viewers was, what? Complete surprise, yeah. which is fantastic. Complete surprise. I'm looking forward to talking to our guest about their reaction yes yes me too that should be exciting yes i'm very excited to talk i know it's a spoiler zone but we still can't talk about their guest not just yet um because it's me in drag (laughs) (laughs) um jason and jacinda what would your drag name be jason selena no, you can't go okay well then you gotta give me like more than that it can't just be selena selena slap face yeah, because she slap slaps your face. If you give me that look. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, um, that's was... it. RuPaul season ten. I do like fake Eleanor's. I do like real Eleanor and her interactions with Chidi this whole episode. She's just pressuring him to make a decision, mm-hmm. like making, saying all these things to make him uncomfortable, and. She's almost doing the role of Michael when he was trying to get him, when he was trying to get GD to try other hobbies. Yeah. Like, I'm going to put you in all these uncomfortable situations just because I'm a jerk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's doing her a good job. Yeah, for she sure. Is. I think part of it is because Michael's so preoccupied with trying to figure out what to do mm-hmm. that he's probably given tasks to yeah, other people. Real Eleanor, you need to pick up my slack. Yeah. Because I gotta fix this burning train wreck <laughs> as it crashes into another car. Yeah. Um, why do you think that everyone in the neighborhood goes along with this whole Pobody's Nerfect thing instead of just continuing to torture Eleanor? False sense of security? Okay. Make her because I, I think the end goal is for her to stay in the good place. So right, yeah. if she, if everybody reacts positively, then maybe she'll feel like she's doing better mm-hmm. and convince herself to stay. She'll just be tortured by their like mom behavior. Oh, man, that would be <laughs> so bad. I would. Their awkward mom behavior, I should uh, clarify. But yeah. Yeah. yeah they'll just be tor. <gasps> They're going to use it for literally like a thousand years. They could just bring it up in all the wrong situations and it would be so annoying. That would get really annoying. Oh. Yeah. Oh, man. (laughs) We're both, like, staring off into space, like... Because I'm thinking about all these high school kids and elementary school kids that I teach and just all the annoying stuff that they say. Like, okay, they have a tendency to use triggered for everything. And they think it's, like, a funny joke and it frustrates me because it's not a joke. And it's so misused and misrepresented that Whoa, it bothers me. You sound pretty triggered right now. That's their reaction to everything. And it bugs me because <laughs> they'll be in class and just be like, I don't want to do this work. Okay, well, you have to get your work done. You know, can I help you? No, I can't do this work. This work is triggering. And you're like, oh, could you just <laughs> oh not? God, they're so or, obnoxious. Or the, the younger ones tend to... 
uh, tend to just say, oh, triggered, triggered, triggered at like everything that's ever said, you know? So they think it's funny and it, it drives me crazy, but I know I can't change the opinion of every single person. I don't have time for that. That's basically what Eleanor would probably be in for for the next like thousand years. Everybody using Pobody's Nerfect. She would, and, would and everybody would be wearing the shirts, annoying. and they'd be like, "Look, Pobody's Nerfect," all the time. Mm. Terrible. Okay, I like it. I like yeah, it. That's my right. that's my head cannon at this point. Yep, that's what would have happened. She just added fuel to the fire. She gave them something to maybe that's why they latch onto her. it. <gasps> they're laughing, but their laughter is actually evil. They're like, hey, 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 we can use this to annoy oh, yeah. her forever. That's great. Okay. Because that Good. was all like, they didn't know that she was going to come up with something like that. So mm. their reaction is genuine. Like, yeah, Michael didn't tell them to all laugh. Mm-mm. But it's kind of nice because you see like one person laugh and then the next person. So it's like, yeah. they're all figuring it out in that moment. And they go, oh, okay. Let's She's laughing. This. All right, Leah, let's let's go with that. Let's start laughing too. Let's yeah. like make a big deal about it. You yeah. know, let's be blow really it annoying about it. Yeah, <laughs> it will make it way funnier than it really is. Yeah. Oh God. Would it start to get so bad that it gets funny again? No. There might be a cycle. Yeah. Okay. Every like five hundred years. You know? <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything else to add? No, that's it. Peace. Okay. <laughs> Peace. All right. Well, thank you so much if you stuck with us for this long. Um, As we said before, send us your thoughts, your comments, your predictions for season two. If you're listening now, you already know that they're in the bad place. Um, Oh, right. So. Spoiler. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen during season two? Because I have so many thoughts and I'm really excited to talk about them in our finale. All right, thank you so much for sticking with us, listening through this rambly spoiler zone. <laughs> I don't ramble. I I dance around subjects. Mm, you're doing the tango around the topics? <laughs> tango around the topics. I did like you that. like that? I did like you that. like that. He I gave like me that. a great look there. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm shocked at your wordplay. <laughs> Yeah, Is that should, even wordplay? I don't use know. Use that wordplay in our Bob's Burgers. Oh. Instead of stealing my ideas. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Anyway. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.